speed. Okay. Morning. Nice to see you guys again. It's been a long time, somebody reminded me. I missed one Sunday, and I've been catching grief ever since. Thank you, Jesse, for bringing the word last week. Um, yes, as many of you know and have reminded me, I have been on a staycation. Um, it, it's like a vacation, but you don't go anywhere, and we've talked about this. Um, we didn't travel we didn't go visit anybody. We didn't get in the car for anything more than a soft serve ice cream at Quick Trip, which is 49 cents, by the way, best value going. Um, we did enjoy uh, doing nothing. Uh, I, I hate to admit that, but I reveled in doing nothing. Um, uh, saw some movies, read a couple of great books. Uh, ate some good food and enjoyed being with my wife for several days, which is a real rarity sometimes in our life. Um, and I also wanted to let you know I got, I enjoyed getting back into a routine that I have missed. I walked about two and a half, three miles every morning. I got up, would walk, and it felt good to do that again. I used to do that a lot. And I walked around my neighborhood, and all around, it's a big, uh, nice walk. And the exercise was really good for me, but one of the things I enjoyed even more than that was reconnecting with my neighborhood, seeing people that I really hadn't seen in months and some even years. Uh, reconnecting. And I also enjoyed this time of year of walking around the neighborhood and seeing how beautiful and green and in full leaf and bloom, everything is. The grass is still that vibrant green that hasn't yet given in to the August sun. You know what I mean? It's still beautiful and green. And with this rain that we've had, it's still moist and, and lush. Um, I love it when my neighborhood looks like this because it reminds me that it's so alive. Uh, it's something about this season. And every season has... It's unique and special feel to it and a unique and special color. Summer, we have the beautiful deep greens. Of course, fall, we have the multicolors. Uh, winter has its own look to it. Uh, spring has its promise. But there's something about the green season of summer that I just love. And it reminded me so much that the church is very much like that. The church, as you may know, has different seasons and different colors for each season. And each season and color is very special. Now, we haven't talked about this. David Watts and I talked about this. It's been seven years since we really brought this up and talked about it in church. And we have so many new faces and new people that I just felt compelled to bring it up again and, and remind us of the different colors and seasons of the church and what this particular season means to us that we are in. So I want to review with you how we got to where we are. During the last seven months, we uh, have been on a journey. This journey started, the church calendar starts in December with the season of Advent. And then it takes us through every remarkable stage of Jesus' life. And during the season of Advent, of course, uh, December, um, we await the coming of the Christ child. The colors that we use uh, instead of these colors, you'll see blue and gold and white. And that's an exciting season because Christmas is exciting. And then during the very short season of Christmas, we celebrate the birth of, of Christ. And we worship him, and just like the shepherds and wise men did. And we use white pyramids because white pyramids represent Christ as Lord and Savior. So all of the banners and all of the stoles are white during the Christmas season. And then we move on to the season of Lent. You remember, it starts with Ash Wednesday. And that's one of my favorite seasons. Um, uh, it's the season that we celebrate Jesus' journey to the cross. And it's a season of repentance and renewal. And it ends with Holy Week, you may remember, when we have Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. And then finally, uh, we have 
Saturday where we wait for Easter. And that whole season of Lent is purple. Everything is purple. And that reminds us of the Lordship and the majesty of Christ. And then Easter morning. We all come and we celebrate. And Easter season begins. And it is a 50-day season when we celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate the living Lord. We celebrate His appearances to the disciples and hundreds of others. And again, we use the white paraments and stoles to reflect the Lordship of Christ. And it leads us up to Pentecost, which we just celebrated two or three weeks ago. Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes. And to symbolize the coming of the Spirit with the tongues of fire, the flames, the fire of the Spirit is represented by the red paraments. That's the birth of the church. And during all of these colorful seasons, we have prepared ourselves, we've anticipated, we've repented, we've reflected, we have celebrated, and we have waited, and we have finally been filled with the Holy Spirit. But now, it's a new season. It's not blue, it's not gold, it's not purple, it's not white, it's not red. It is green. And if you look on your bulletin, as a famous frog once said, it ain't easy being green sometimes. It's not easy if you're a frog for sure, but it's also not easy in the church. It's not easy because for the past seven months we've been so caught up in all the other colors, colors and seasons and celebrations. We've had such a good time on that journey that sometimes during the green season we forget that we have a job description now. Once Pentecost happens, we have a job description. It's all been leading up to this. And it's a job description that is only for us. It's a job that only we as Christians can do. And our scripture for today tells us very clearly what that is. So I would invite you, as you are able, to please stand as we read together from Acts. This is like Luke part 2. This is the continuation of the story of the Gospel of Luke. And I want to put this in context for you. Jesus has been crucified. He has resurrected. He has appeared countless times to, as we said, several hundred people over the course of 40 days. And now, he's for the final time on earth with his disciples. And I've got Acts 1-8 as the principal verse, but I'm going to read the first seven to set you up for that verse. Because that verse is our job description. So let's start with Acts 1 verse 1. And this is Luke writing in my former book Theophilus Theophilus meaning beloved or loved one uh, dear friend I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen after his suffering he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, when they met together, they asked him, Lord... Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And here's the verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you be seated, please? And right after this is when it says that he was taken up into heaven. 
And they did not see him after that. For the past few months, as I said, we've celebrated the central events in the life of Jesus. And we've studied the story of a man who is a man, but a man who is also God. Fully human and yet fully divine. And that is a story that is pretty much, in essence, the central mystery of Christianity. Fully human and fully divine. This story of the incarnation. It's a word we don't talk about much during the, the season outside of Advent. The incarnation. Incarnation, um, which means that God became human. Incarnate is a Latin word, incarnus, which means basically in flesh. means that God became just like us. He became flesh and blood. He took on the form and the substance of a human being. But he was still God. John, in his gospel, describes it like this. In John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, Word, which means Christ. <laughs> and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he goes on in verse 14, The Word, capital W, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John tells us very clearly that Jesus pre-existed as the Son, as part of the Trinity, pre-existed, and then was made incarnate, in flesh, to be a human being. Both fully human and fully divine. You may be interested to know that these two candles that we have on the altar represent the fact of the full humanity and the full divinity of Jesus Christ. That's what those candles represent. That's what we celebrate as Christians. It's a mystery of our faith. And when we think of the incarnation, most of us think of it this way, that God walked on earth physically... For 33 or so years. Then he died. Then he rose. Then he returned to heaven. When he left. He sent the Holy Spirit to be present among us. But the actual physical body of Jesus was gone. It was gone forever. Jesus was here among us. Healing, teaching, revealing God's love. For his full life of 33 years. But he's not here as a human being anymore. We're very clearly told in verse 9 of what we just read. He ascended at that very moment up into the clouds and they saw him no more. And while the Holy Spirit is very real, the Holy Spirit is not the actual physical presence of God. And sometimes I find myself wishing Oh, Lord, I wish that that physical presence was here. I wish Jesus was physically here right now in the flesh. I would love to talk with Jesus in person. I'd love to shake his hand. I'd love to, heck, I'd love to hug him. I'd love to crawl up in his lap and be comforted from time to time. I'd like to look into those eyes that are so beautifully depicted there, and see the depth of love and compassion. You know what I mean? Sometimes I find, to my shame, that I'm very much like Thomas, the disciple, who needed to touch Jesus just to be assured of the truth of it all. And I think of this wonderful story that I heard years ago about a child who woke up one night after a very frightening nightmare. And the little girl was convinced that there were all kinds of monsters and goblins hiding under her bed and in the closet, and that every shadow she saw was something that was out to get her. I still feel that way sometimes. but um, So, as little girls and little boys do, she was scared, so she ran to her parents' bedroom, and after her mother had calmed her down, she took her back into her room. And said, you don't need to be afraid. You're not alone in here. God is right here with you in your room. And the little girl looked up 
She said, I know that. I know that God is here. But right now, I need somebody in my room with skin on. Now, that's cute. That's funny. But it's true. You ever felt like that? We know instinctively that God is with us. We know that the Holy Spirit is present. But sometimes, we just need someone with skin on. We need God to be present here and now in the flesh. Someone we can see and hear and touch and talk to and even smell. We need someone with skin on. And we need Him when we need Him. We need Him in our everyday lives. We need Him sometimes when we're at home or at school or even at the grocery store and heck, sometimes even here at church. We need God to hold us when we're down and discouraged. We need God to give us that gentle kick in the backside when we ignore someone in need. We need a God with skin on. But if Jesus has ascended into heaven and He sent the Holy Spirit, where is the physical presence of God today? Where is God with skin today? And I would submit to you that it's a lot closer than you may think. Because you see, when the Holy Spirit came to fill up those believers on that very first day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came with as if tongues of fire in this rushing wind, after Jesus had gone back to heaven, when the Holy Spirit did that, God took on flesh again. God got some skin that day. Not in the same way when Jesus was born, not, not as an incarnation, but using the Holy Spirit to fill believers. You see, when the Holy Spirit filled the disciples that day, God decided that was good, I'm sure. He said, this is good because you remember on that day, how many were added to their number, how many people came to believe Christ because of that on that very day? Over 3,000 came to believe in Christ that day because when the Spirit filled the disciples, they started telling people. They became God with skin on. And ever since then, God has been sending His Spirit into believers to be God with skin on even today. I'm convinced that on that very first day of God became dependent on human beings in a whole and He's been dependent on us as human beings ever since. See, this is the season of Pentecost. It's sometimes called the season of ordinary time. That's inspiring. An ordinary time. Um, but ordinary doesn't mean dull or we think ordinary means. The word ordinary in ordinary came from uh, the Latin word ordinal, which means numbered. So that means that these days are numbered for a specific purpose. Many of you or longtime Methodists may remember this was a season that was called Kingdom Tide. And during Kingdom Tide, pretty much every preacher in the Methodist system was preaching on the teachings of Jesus and people about the gospel message of Christ. It's a season of being green, going green. And we know going green in today's world has a very environmental feel to it because we hear about going green all the time with our Recycling and automobiles that are going electric and going green, being good stewards of our resources. And it's the very similar in the church in the green season. The season of going green in church, it's this next six months or so when there's not a whole lot of major events on the church calendar. The next big thing is Advent. Believe it or not, the next big season <laughs> comes right after Thanksgiving. Is that so? got like six months of ordinary time, season of green, and what's it for? And I will tell you what I believe it's for. It, as much as I love the seasons of Advent and, and Lent, 
um, Easter, Christmas. I believe that this season of green is by far the most important season in the church. And why is that? Because this is the season of growth. This is the season when God fills us again with His Holy Spirit. It's a season when God renews the body of Christ, just like we see around us when everything green and blooming has been renewed and it's healthy. That's a, pretty much what God's done in the church, I believe. It's the season to make sure that God has skin on in our community and beyond. And what does that mean? Just like it did 2,000 years ago, it's a season where we focus more on sharing the gospel, feeding the hungry, welcoming the poor, because now God is depending on us to do it. And the green banners and paraments that you see, they represent the new birth and the growth of the church. Many of you, I know uh, some of you <laughs> have gardens and are farmers. Uh, We've been through the season of plowing and planting and weeding. Soon it'll be the season of harvest. In the church, this is the season where we do the same thing. It's a season where we get our hands dirty. Because now it's totally up to us. St. Teresa of Avila wrote something beautiful about that very thought. She said, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion must look out onto the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless us now. In a nutshell, St. Teresa is saying it's up to us. But it's not easy, is it, sometimes? It's not easy being green <laughs> but it is easy if we understand how simple it truly is at Christmas we celebrate the birth of God made human during Lent and Easter we celebrate the new birth that we have in Christ on Pentecost we celebrate the birth of the church and during now this green season we celebrate God's call on us where God is given skin in the body of Christ. And I, I'm just going to close with these observations. What would that look like? What does it look like for God to have skin on? You see, I would say this. God with skin on the outside is simply us with God on the inside. Let me say that again. God with skin on the outside is very simply us with God on the inside. The Holy Spirit of God shining through. I see God with skin on every day in this church. I see Him in our staff and volunteers who do more than many of you will ever know to meet the needs of the people in our church and our community. I see Him in those who volunteer with our children and our youth I see him in the quiet givers the ones who step up when there's a need and insist that nobody knows about that I see him in families who adopt children or serve as foster parents that is truly God with skin on for those most in need I see him in our manna food pantry, providing food and hope and dignity and respect to those who come to be blessed by a bag of food. They get so much more when they come there. I see him when there's a tragedy with the outpouring of love and prayers, and we've all had something difficult in our life and I think right now of Cheryl and Kevin I see God with skin on right out here I see him in you I see him during fellowship with hugs and handshakes I see him before and after church with words of encouragement 
I see him in a simple cup of coffee and a smile between friends. God has a lot of skin on right here. And I just want to remind you that, friends, this is the green season and there's a lot to do. Jesus reminded the people who were listening to him. He said, y'all, the harvest, there's a lot of harvesting to do. And there's not that many workers to do it. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, too few. So it's time for us to go to work. It is time for us all to be green. Are you ready? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the seasons that you have ordained in our world and also in our church. We thank you now, Lord, for this season that follows the coming of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that it has infused your people with the desire to spread the word, to share the gospel, to feed the hungry, to be God with skin on here, there, and everywhere. Father, may it be so, not just during the green season, but every day of every year, that we would seek to be like you and to love others more than we love ourselves. And we ask it in the precious name of Christ our Lord. Amen.